Hello and good morning and welcome to, to everyone to today's event. Uh, I'm Konstantinos Yarikos. I'm coming from uh, WWF Greece and also a member of the Society for the Protection of Biodiversity of Thrace. And I'll be your host for this morning. Uh, a few introductory words about uh, why we're here today. The, the Society for the, for the Protection of Biodiversity of Thrace is a kind of newly established local organization in, in Thrace. It has its, uh, its uh, center in, uh, in the Dadia village in, uh, in, in the central Ebros. And it was established uh, three years ago. Um, it is kind of, of the continuation of the work done by many organizations, many national organizations in the, uh, in the wider region of, of Thrace and Eastern Macedonia, uh, a hotspot region for biodiversity in Greece and, uh, and in Europe, a very important area for, the, for birds of prey, uh, but not only, not only for birds. Uh, so the, the society was established three years ago with, with a focus, a strategic focus on the protection of endangered uh, bird species, especially raptors. Uh, but not only that, also with a focus in protecting the viable habitats of the area and the landscapes that are important, both for birds and the biodiversity overall, and of course, for, for local societies and, and people. Um, through the years of working in, in, this, in this region, what we know is that one of the most important threats uh, birds of prey uh, face uh, is the development of renew renewable energy sources and especially wind farms. Um, as we heard on, on, on the video before, wind farms are, of course, a very important part of the equation of increasing renewable energy sources around the world and in, and in Greece, but at the same time, they do come with a toll uh, on nature when they are not uh, cited in a, in, a, in, a, in a careful in a careful manner. Uh, the, the region of Thrace is a, a wind farm development priority area for the Greek government. And during the past years, we have seen almost 300 uh, wind turbines being installed uh, on, on in the area. Uh, these have brought very important cumulative effects on, on bird populations. Uh, but despite that, uh, each uh, wind farm still is evaluated, its, it's uh, siting is evaluated uh, as per the impacts of the, of the particular wind farm and not taking into account the cumulative effects it has along with all the other uh, uh, wind turbines already, already uh, in place. So that, that's what the reason one of the first priorities of, of the society was to, to develop an initiative exactly to evaluate this cumulative effect and produce the kind of guidance to the Greek government and, and services and permitting services as to how we should proceed in the future uh, with, with the development of renewable energy uh, in, in, the, in the region. Uh, so last year, uh, we had six studies being concluded on, on, uh, on the matter. Uh, they included everything from you know, an analysis of, of the legal framework to an analysis of, of, the, of the processes uh, of, the, of the permit procedures and, and how the, uh, the terms of the permit procedures are upheld uh, once the, the, the turbines are in place. And then a number of, of, of studies looking at the impacts of specific species and habitats. So the, 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 the aim of, of today's event, of today's discussion is exactly to present to you and discuss the conclusions of, of these six studies. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the typical side of the matter, let me mention that this, this whole uh, work uh, was, uh, was uh, supported in the framework of a wider national initiative taken by WWF Greece uh, for the protection of iconic species in, in the country, an initiative that brings together more than uh, almost 10 uh, national NGOs to work on flagship species and flagship issues for, for their protection. And as I said, the, the aim of these studies was exactly to fill in a knowledge gap and produce guidance for Thrace primarily, but then guidance that can be replicated, can be taken further to, to other sites, because this is not a problem just of Thrace. This is a problem we are facing in many places around the world, and we need to find a solution to reconcile uh, our urgent need to face cli the climate crisis with our equally urgent need to preserve the world's biodiversity. Um, on the methodological si side of the studies, 
I, uh, we need to mention that the what you will be hearing today is five out of the six studies uh, that were implemented separately and independently. So you might see a, a slight differences in the number of wind farms they refer to or the number of wind parks they refer to. That's because maybe each of the researchers was based on a slightly different period or on a slightly different um, uh, data set about the, the, the renewable energy analyzed. Now, on, on the house rules uh, for, for this morning, uh, we will, as I said, we will uh, hear five presentations uh, in, the, in the agenda that has been shared with you. There were six presentations. There was one starting presentation that had it to do with the legal framework in Greece. Um, we had a long discussion about that issue. We, we had a, a long of questions yesterday when we, when we ran the same presentations for, for the Greek crowd. And we decided that this was a, a presentation not really relevant to an international audience. So we decided uh, not to have this presentation today, so to leave more space for, for, for discussion. So five presentations, roughly 50 minutes, 15 minutes uh, each, and then some space uh, for questions. Uh, participants cannot raise your hands. You cannot raise your hands. You cannot open your microphone, so you cannot intervene live in the discussions. Uh, if you have questions, you should be writing them in the Q&A tab, which is on the, on the bottom uh, of, of your Zoom uh, window next to the participants and the chat and, and everything. You'll see a Q&A tab. That's where you can write your questions. We have a back office team that will be filtering uh, the questions, grouping them, and then passing them on to me and, and, the, and the speakers for, for answers. Uh, the discussion for the economy of, of time is not open uh, to interventions and opinions. Uh, we are sorry for that, but we needed to have a compact program so that everybody can, can follow the whole of the, uh, of the discussion. Uh, if uh, uh, specific opinions or interventions are written in the Q&A or in the comments, we will be recording them. We will be keeping them in, in record to enrich uh, our communication, our further work uh, on the matter, but they will not be discussed uh, today. Um, so this is a framework and our rules. We can we can directly move to, to the first presentation. We have with us uh, Dr. Eleftherios Kakalis. Uh, Dr. Kakalis is a forester and, and ornithologist uh, who has been working on research projects and conservation projects for many years, and he has done uh, some very interesting work that has to do with the permit system and how the different terms uh, put on companies are then upheld during the operation of the wind farm. Uh, Leferis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your good words. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I'm, I'm still trying to. I'm, I have a lot of experience in uh, bite monitoring and uh, programs and uh, evaluation of uh, studies and, in, and doing studies. Uh, so I will uh, go. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, to say thanks to, to the Society of the Protection of Biodiversity in Thrush for this opportunity to present my work. And uh, let's go straight to the uh, my presentation. Is it okay? So, uh, our study was to examine the examination of environmental terms and the evaluation of the appropriate assessments and monitoring programs for the wind farms in Thras. So, the study uh, was divided in five sections. The first sec sec section was about uh, uh, the status of the wind farms in Thras. Uh, the second was about the analysis of uh, the environmental condition, uh, conditions approval decisions. Uh, the third section was about the analysis of the primary data from the monitoring uh, programs. And uh, uh, the fourth section was about the evaluation of the studies. And uh, the fifth and the last uh, was about uh, 
drawing conclusions and making recommendations. So today I will focus uh, on the third section. Uh, I will present uh, because I'm the first presenting uh, the, the first panelist. So I will uh, describe the status more or less uh, in trust about the wheat farms, but I will focus uh, in uh, the analysis that we made in primary data. So the wind farm development in Thrash uh, it has uh, steadily increased uh, from 2001 until today. 62% of the existing wind turbines are located in the Natura 2000 network, uh, while 97% uh, uh, of the turbines are within the important belt areas. Um, there is a high investment interest for the future for the future for new farms to be installed. So the technical characteristics of the existing wind turbines uh, show a great uh, variability in nominal power, rotor diameter, and uh, the tower height. Uh, and uh, installing new wind turbines is expected to increase the diversity in the dangerous collision zone for uh, vulnerable bird species. So the studies uh, should invest all these changes through the time. Let's go to the data that we gather from the studies. And uh, the first, uh, we should discuss the distribution of the most important species in thrust based on uh, the studies data set. Uh, the black vulture and the griffon vulture and the golden eagle, uh, we can say they are present almost everywhere in the area. Um, we started, we, we tried to, to build a, a a, an index based on the data of the studies. So we created, we calculated or estimated the flights per 10 hours in danger zone of uh, the wind farms where possible. So uh, the data set for the black vulture and griffon vulture is presented. And we can say that uh, there is a very high spatial coherence for uh, these two vulture species, the black and the griffon vultures in the area. So after that, we um, estimate the cumulated flight index for vultures, and uh, the low in the, the low values of the index goes in the peripheral areas, you know, for Adopi, area is this area here if you see my cash in this area while high index values uh, was placed in the central uh, area maintenance area of Rodopi prefecture is this area and uh, the most in uh, the most uh, wind farms placed in uh, Everest prefecture this area if you see my cash uh, the collisions uh, we have, the vulture collisions we have uh, in thrust uh, are in spatial coherence with this cumulative uh, flight index. And um, I, I should say that there are important information gaps for many wind farms coming from um, inappropriate studies. Uh, if you see the question marks uh, in the gray areas, uh, data is missing here. So we don't, uh, we cannot estimate the flight index for these areas. The gray zone, the, uh, the gray wind farms. So um, we try to analyze the uh, data coming from automated bird collision avoidance systems. 
So we had uh, available data for three wind farms and um, we calculated the percentage of light that uh, resulted in uh, rotor storage to avoid uh, collision in the turbine. So let's say low percentage values, percentage values should indicate high levels of uh, turbine avoidance by birds. Uh, and high percentage values should indicate low levels of, of, of that avoidance by birds, despite the activation of warning sounds of the automated systems. And the result is uh, in this diagram, sorry that it's in Greek, but uh, I will explain you, uh, for example, the high values, the high percentage, we have for black vulture is 47% for black vulture. Uh, short toy eagle has high values, black stork also, and griffon vulture. So we can say that about uh, half of the black vulture or and uh, one third of griffon vulture flights that uh, trigger the systems resulted in uh, rotor stoppage to avoid the collision. And uh, until the end of uh, 2000, last year, uh, there were two incidents of collision with wind, turbi wind turbines equipped with automated system, one involving a black vulture and one involving a booty tiger. So uh, have in mind that uh, we, uh, after we produce this index, the flight index, uh, per 10 hours, and uh, we have this percentage of light resulting to a rotor stoppage. Uh, we estimated uh, for five different scenarios of vulture presence uh, on an annual base, the expected cases that would result in a rotor stoppage in the wheat farms for one year. So we create this. Um, uh, the X axis is the flight, uh, the, the flight index, and um, uh, the X, uh, 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 the, the, uh, and the, we are showing the number of the expected uh, cases that would, would result in the rotor stoppage. And uh, we compare these scenarios that we made with actual data coming from the uh, wind parks with automated systems. So the area in the, in the red box uh, is the actual data uh, and these cases of rotor stoppage involving vultures uh, per wind turbine for the year 2020. And uh, in the right side, of the figure is the um, uh, scenarios that we made based uh, on uh, the flight, uh, uh, the flights per 10 hours in uh, zone A, the danger zone. Uh, this is coming from the pre-construction environmental study data set. <clears throat> the first conclusion that uh, we can say that uh, based on the wind turbine of this uh, wind farm named uh, Gramatikaki and uh, uh, wind farm number seven. Uh, the data is in accordance with the scenario of uh, 115 days of vulture presence in the danger zone. And the, the second conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, it was probably, probably, probably to estimate this high risk of collisions with the appropriate analysis of the data, making different scenarios in the pre-construction study. So here I will present, uh, this is the same uh, wind farm, and this is the total cases of uh, rotor stoppage involving vultures in the wind turbines in 2002, 2020. Uh, a lot of cases, cases of, for black vulture also for griffon vulture and one case uh, for Egyptian vulture. 
The flight index was about 1.76 flights of vultures per 10 hours in John A. Uh, the second uh, wind farm that we analyzed, uh, the cases were, were lower, but we had uh, 175 cases of black vulture and the index was uh, lower of the flight index. So uh, the question is, is uh, what was the appropriate assessment of the, for, for the collision risk for the vultures in these cases? So uh, we present the, the, the flight index for black vulture, and uh, we present only the pre-construction studies. And um, uh, down you, you see the significance of, uh, uh, of the assessment uh, uh, for collision risk. And uh, this is the two cases here in the red box of uh, the wind parks that uh, was presented in the, the last slide. And uh, the first strange thing is that uh, the assessment was the same. Uh, it was low to medium significance uh, or low to medium effects for collision risk. And the other thing that is uh, quite strange uh, I can say, uh, is that um, uh, the low uh, significant effects should have low values for the flight index. In, of, and again, the, the high level of, uh, of the effects should, should have high, level, high values of the index. So this is not happening in, for uh, black vulture, and it's not uh, happening for griffon vultures. Uh, we have a lot of uh, assessments uh, that um, somehow uh, they are not related with the index, the flight index. So our conclusion uh, is this. Uh, this is quite strange what uh, happened. So the collision risk for vulture species was not assessed as being of high significance in any, in any of studies. So these uh, uh, assessments are questioned uh, by the high index values of the vulture flights in zone A for at least seven wind farms. If we see the Gramatikaki in the figure in the center, uh, there are a lot of uh, other wind farms with higher flight index values. Uh, and we consider this, uh, these wind farms to have uh, the same um, results as the Gramatikaki uh, wind farm, and, uh, and we also, the collision assessments uh, are questioned by the statistics of the operating automated systems, the known uh, vulture collisions in the area, we have 14 cases, and the large information gaps in many, for many uh, wind farms. So we can say, um, uh, with confidence that uh, in several uh, wind farms in trust, there are numerous improperly placed wind turbines um, that the exact number of them or quantity of which remains unknown. So all the cases presented in the previous slides where it comes uh, uh, is coming mainly from pre-construction studies. Uh, and the pre-construction studies were evaluated as the most comprehensive uh, studies in the assessment we conducted. The post-construction studies were evaluated lower due to significant uh, methodological deficiencies in various 
parameters. For example, uh, talking about the post-construction post studies, the collision risk was not estimated for 54% uh, of the studies. The cumulative effects, effects were not estimated for 62. Uh, the data from the automated system monitoring uh, was not compared with the monitoring of coming from the vantage points. Uh, the bird mortality was estimated uh, by indices per wind turbine in only 15% uh, of studies. And uh, I'm coming to some of our basic proposals. Uh, as a matter of the wind parks of, uh, with automated uh, bird collision avoidance systems, we should uh, Eval uh, make an evaluation of the effectiveness of uh, automated systems. Um, mainly uh, to, uh, to study the, how effective it is to, to, to vultures or to large uh, raptors. Um, we need to make a uh, studies uh, need to make a comparison of the monitoring results uh, coming from uh, the um, uh, automated systems and uh, with the other monitoring methods. Uh, in the studies, uh, the, 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 there were only a few cases that uh, in the studies that uh, and they made that. Uh, so uh, for some for some reasons we should do it. So about bird monitoring programs in pre and or post construction studies, uh, we need to use uh, reference sites. The experimental design of these uh, studies uh, is not using a, a batch experimental design, and we should do it. And uh, we should uh, use the same scientific objectives and methodologies in pre and post construction studies, and mainly to estimate collision risk or cumulative effects. Um, the collision risk uh, should be estimated uh, per wind turbine and not for the whole coverage zone of the wind park. The majority of the studies uh, uh, were estimated, uh, we're making estimates for the whole coverage zone of the wind parks and not per wind turbine. And uh, we need uh, an adaptation of specific protocols and analysis guidelines for primary data analysis for the studies. And we propose the creation of an open access data, uh, access data, data set containing all the raw data per method and the significant findings from its study. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lefteris, uh, Mr. Kakalis, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And I have a question uh, here on uh, on what you presented. That is uh, whether the results of uh, this post-monitoring reports and the automated system reports, which we understand they have some, some deficiencies, they have many deficiencies, but still they, they produce a data set that, that is very useful if analyzed uh, correctly, whether these results are actually used in practice by the services. Are the permits procedures or the permits, uh, you know, the, uh, the terms they impose on, on, the, on new developments educated or updated according to, to the results we have from, from all these uh, post evaluations. Uh, first of all, uh, they should uh, the data that uh, uh, this monitoring produce should be analyzed by the environmental consultants that they are doing the studies. Uh, the majority of the uh, the majority of them uh, or in the studies they just. Uh, um, uh, take the the report from from the from the company that uh, uh, is producing this data and um, 
they don't analyze them. They don't uh, uh, compare the, the data. So uh, first of all, the environmental consultants should use this data and analyze the, da the data. They don't do it. Okay, I see. Is, is, is uh, what you're saying is that uh, we also need some, some kind of more independent evaluations of, of, of the data because we're now based exclusively on, on what the companies say about, uh, about these post studies? I really don't know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure because um, this data, they should uh, use this data and analyze this data. We don't need to something uh, to be independent or, or um, it's a good idea uh, for the quality of the studies, but um, this sh should uh, an environmental consultants should do it. They don't do it, and uh, uh, there is a lack of uh, a gap of information here or uh, a gap of um, in the procedures that uh, okay. of doing these studies in doing these studies. Very clear. And I have a, a second question, um, which is what kind of automated bird collision avoidance systems have been installed in, in the parks? It, the majority uh, is uh, DT bird. Okay. System. For the majority of uh, the, the wind park. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, I think uh, this wraps it up and we can move to the, to the second uh, presentations. Uh, many thanks, uh, Mr. Kagalis, also for, for keeping up with, uh, with the time. <laughs> we're doing well on, on, on that sector. So we're moving on to the, uh, to the second presentation that has uh, elaborates on, on, on a, a different type of, of impact that has to do with the, the impact of the actual installation of wind farms uh, on the on the land use and the land and the and the land cover, uh, we have with us uh, two speakers today on that subject. Uh, Dr. Fotis Xistrakis, who is a researcher, a phytosociologist in his expertise and a researcher at the Institute for Forestry Research, and Dr. Christos Damianidis, uh, who is also a forest researcher with uh, with many years of of experience in uh, phytosociological uh, research and mapping. So. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Good morning from our side. Good morning. Let's go to um, screen share. And we go here. So um, thank you for the introduction. We will um, try to uh, assess and describe our methodology and our results regarding the impact of the construction of uh, wind farms and the, uh, uh, also the construction of the roads that facilitate the, the construction and the operation of the wind farms in the land cover and the land uses of, the, of our study area. So the aim of the study, first of all, is the assessment of the extent of intervention, uh, how much surface area has been uh, destroyed from the construction of the wind farms and the roads. And the second part is also the assessment of uh, which type of land cover has been uh, affected by this um, by this construction, and uh, not only in terms of land cover, but also in terms of the habitat types of the uh, uh, of the habitats directive, this 9243 directive, which is also my speciality. So the presentation will be uh, divided in two parts. The first part regarding the methods we we followed will be uh, held by uh, Christos Damianidis, and the second part with the results is going to be my turn, okay, so. Okay, uh, about the methodology that we follow, uh, the study area includes uh, uh, 10 municipal units of uh, five municipalities of Euro and Rodopi regional units that are uh, located in Eastern Macedonia. Thrak region, as we can see in the map. Uh, it includes uh, 36 wind farms uh, that are licensed uh, license for production, installation, or operation 
in which the 332 wind turbines have been or will be installed in the future. About the methodology now, we have the two sections. The third uh, section uh, has to do with ex the, <clears throat> the existing wind turbines. Uh, we, um, uh, um, we make a, a detailed mapping of the forestation and, and uh, distribution of uh, disturbance of natural vegetation as a direct uh, consequence of all intervention that took place. Uh, uh, the second uh, section has to do with the uh, wind turbines that are in procedure of installation. For those turbines, uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, make an estimation uh, uh, 50 meters, uh, a circle of uh, radius of 50 meters, and uh, we uh, choose the center that was proposed uh, from the data that was provided from the RAE website. Uh, about the network, the road network, uh, we create uh, two linear shape file. The one was uh, about the 1996. Uh, we have uh, aerial photo for this period that the installation has not uh, started. And the second linear shape file was for the from the satellite image of 2000. Uh, 21. So we create two linear shape files uh, for the, this period that I was uh, told. Um, after the creation of the this linear shape file, uh, we take uh, for each road for each period uh, a width of the road, as we can see in the image uh, on the right. Uh, we take the width of 2000 uh, of the two periods, and uh, we create a polygon, uh, a polygon shape file, uh, both for 1996, uh, 1996 and uh, 2021. Uh, the two polygons uh, of, of the year 1996 were spatially abstracted, uh, spatial the spatial difference between the two periods from the road polygons of the year 2000. Uh, uh, 21. Uh, there are some cases that there was no roads in 1996, so the, this polygon that was uh, produced from the abstraction was, has to do with a new road network. Um, so, about the vegetation now. Uh, we have uh, created uh, four land cover classes uh, about grasslands, shrublands, forest, and uh, anthropogenic or other uses. Uh, the, the classification, uh, the classes was in, uh, identified by visual interpretation in the historical area photos. And um, the overlap between the two periods, as we made it in, in the road network, um, on mapping, uh, demonstrate the change in last land use due to the construction of installation sites of wind turbines and also for the accompanying facilities as well as the opening or widening the road network, uh, network sorry, uh, servicing the wind farms. Uh, after we um, have finished uh, this uh, procedure, we um, assigned uh, these areas in uh, habitat types of the national or union interest, uh, Directive 9243. And uh, the assignment was made after uh, we made some field visits in order to identify, um, identify uh, the the habitat types in the field. Okay. Results now. It's my turn now. Thank you. So, um, having followed this uh, methodology, we actually concluded that uh, in the total 332 wind turbines, 
that uh, have been installed. Uh, there was a total area of 126 hectares that uh, was actually um, an intervention for the uh, in the 36 uh, wind power stations. Uh, 55 of these uh, wind turbines are located uh, in uh, in wind power plants in wind farms, which uh, have not been yet constructed. So. Um, this area is yet to be uh, uh, intervented from the constructions. Uh, there was also an addition of 54.62 hectares uh, that uh, was actually an intervention and, and destruction of natural uh, habitats from the construction or the widening of uh, the road network. Um, so that makes a total area a total surface area of 181.50 uh, hectares. And most of the, uh, uh, sorry, most of these uh, uh, wind farms are located in the uh, municipality of uh, Ariani, uh, with uh, more than 50% of this area. So regarding the time allocation of uh, these interventions in, the natural land cover. We see that from uh, we take uh, forgot to mention that we take this data from the uh, RAE website. So it means that when uh, uh, we consider the time of construction that was provided from the uh, from the uh, wind farms. Okay, so from the period of two thousand two to two thousand seven, we can see that there is a, an intense uh, construction activity. Uh, then there is uh, somehow a pause from the period of 2007 to 2016. And then from the last five years, we have uh, again an increased uh, activity. 50% of the total area from the uh, intervention of the wind uh, turbines lo uh, locations are actually has already been done since uh, 2009. So it's quite old story. And yet there is 25% of the area that is yet has to be uh, that is yet to be uh, um, constructed. So these are for these uh, wind turbines that they have they uh, haven't been installed yet. Um, regarding this uh, percentage, I have to say that uh, maybe considering this 50 meters radius. To, for the estimation of the total surface area of the new constructions. And maybe it's too much because we've seen that the average uh, of the existing uh, wind uh, turbine installation sites is uh, a little bit less than this. But uh, if we consider that the rotors are getting bigger and bigger, and if we also consider that uh, there is no estimation of the road, of the new roads that will be constructed for these new wind turbines, uh, we consider that this is a, a very good approximation of, of a real surface area that uh, will be impacted. Uh, regarding the land use and the land cover of the, uh, of the site, we realized that the largest part of the total surface area actually refer to grasslands. And this is normal because the, uh, the wind turbines are built uh, along the ridges and along the ridges, uh, grasslands dominate. In the, at least in the study area. Um, but there is also a large part that uh, refers to natural forests. And uh, usually, and mostly, these are um, forests of broadleaf species that includes uh, mainly uh, Quercus, uh, oaks, and uh, some part of uh, beech, fungus forests. Um, there is a small part that affects that impacts uh, conifer, uh, land cover of conifer species. And this is mainly the Pinus brutia forest that we find in the area. Uh, and I have to say that in these 2.21 hectares in the conifer species, in the conifer forest, uh, reforestations are not included. So we talk about natural forests here. Uh, regarding the habitat types, we realized that the interventions took place in six uh, habitat types of community interest. 
in one habitat type of national interest and two habitats which are uh, related with uh, human induced and man made uses. Um, in forest habitat types, um, the intervention took place mainly in broadleaf species, in the forest of broadleaf species, that includes the habitat type 91M0, that includes all the broadleaf uh, oak uh, forests of the area. And regarding the conifers, the habitat type is the 9540 that includes all pin, natural pinus brutia forests of the area. Again, reforestations uh, are not included here. Um, as I said, the majority uh, of uh, interventions took place in uh, grassland uh, habitat types. Unfortunately, for the study area, we cannot really distinguish uh, which of the habitat types of the grassland habitat types that may occur in the in the study area were uh, impacted. But this is somehow serious because uh, one of the grassland habitat types is a priority grassland habitat type, this is 60 to 20, and the other is yet a, a community, a habitat of community interest, but not a priority. But this has to be uh, uh, resolved. But the only way to conclude which habitat type was uh, impacted, uh, we need some uh, vegetation sampling during the, uh, some basically vegetation sampling to describe correctly and appropriately the vegetation. Regarding the roads, we can say that the pattern uh, of um, impacts is more or less the same, like uh, the, the installation sites of uh, wind turbines. Uh, roads mostly affected grasslands, then forests, and then scrublands. And as we see here also with the combined results in the graphs on the, on the right side, we see that the pattern and um, the, the, the impacted sites, the impacted surface area is analogous and is directly respected to the surface area that was uh, impacted for the wind uh, turbine installation sites. So regarding the cumulative impacts, uh, we have an abstracted consideration of the intervention from the construction of installation sites and roads for each wind farm. Uh, that actually hides, in my opinion, the cumulative impacts over broad geographical areas. And this has to be taken into consideration. And the estimation of cumulative impacts, I believe, we believe that must be fair to specific geographical units of standardized surface, surface area. And so the results are comparable when actually we try to compare how much has been affected in each of these geographical units with the next or the uh, other similar geographical units in the same area. And of course, uh, the use of these standardized geographical units also give us an, an opportunity for a standardized methodology to estimate this impact, this cumulative impact. Um, we consider that the European reference grid, which is uh, the grid of 10 by 10 kilometer or less, uh, can be used as a reference spatial unit because this is actually uh, is uh, a, a, the spatial unit which area and range of uh, habitat types and species uh, for the assessment of the area and the range of the habitat types and the species of the habitats directive is used also for the birds directive, see if I'm not wrong. And, um, I think we should start discussing of uh, proposing a certain threshold of the total surface area of interventions that they are allowed to take place within a grid cell. That has to do with uh, a total of surface area within uh, the grid cell, a total surf a threshold of total surface area impacted within the natural uh, land cover of uh, each hub of each grid cell, because you can realize that each of these grid cells, this 10 by 10 kilometers, may include. Uh, also settlements may include uh, uh, agricultural land and so on. It's not all natural uh, uh, land cover. And yeah, so just uh, res uh, resuming, the estimation of cumulative impacts, actually we see that the installation of wind farms resulted in uh, in total of 181 hectares of intervention. 126 of them is in installation sites and 54.62 hectares refer to roads. This uh, this 54.6 hectares of roads, it's a quite large percentage. So the uh, the impact because of the road construction is not should not be neglected and should be also considered uh, seriously considered 
during the, the constructions. Uh, interventions took place mainly in grasslands, as it is the dominant land cover type. Um, as I said, there is a certain need to assess if grasslands are assigned to the priority habitat type 60 to 20. And this is more specific because this, in, this intervention, these impacts, this change of land cover has to be also related to the national and site-specific conservation objectives for the habitat types and the species. I'm going to say that because um, there is the new law that there is no, um, uh, it's not possible to reduce the surface area of a habitat type of national, of sorry, of a habitat type of community interest. And if you do so, you have to take some measures to restore these habitats. And this is not only for the, this is not only site specific within each of the Natura 2000 site, but also refers to the national uh, objectives. So within Greece, whatever is destroyed has to be uh, restored somehow. Uh, so, and there is also, there is uh, a need to consider a standardized special units for the estimation of cumulative impacts over uh, broader, not boarded, broader geographical units. Um, thank you for your attendance. And um, yeah, I hope it was interesting. Thank you very much to, to, to both of you for, for a very interesting uh, presentation, accompanying works of uh, for wind farms, but not, and renewables in, in, in general is a, is a great consideration. Uh, in Greece and having an international crowd today, we, we can mention that it is a very uh, a very uh, conflictuous issue around Greece and especially in, in small islands and areas with, with uh, strong landscape considerations. Uh, I have a question uh, for you, which has to do with whether in your, your analysis, your estimations, you have also calculated the road embankments uh, on the sides of the roads, downstream and upstream of the roads, as the question is, uh, is posed, and around the, the wind turbine bases. Um, and, and if it was not included, if you have an estimate of, of the underestimation uh, you may have had of the cleared area. Let me say some words for you. Uh, okay, about the calculation. We take the, the polygon that we was provided by RAE website, that was a buffer, only the construction zone of the, of the wind farm. It was very limited. So we limited only in the borders of these polygons. Uh, during the procedure of uh, mapping, uh, we realized that uh, <clears throat> the habitat loss or the land uh, change was, uh, <clears throat> uh, was uh, big, uh, was uh, much more, uh, than uh, this, uh, but we also include uh, in this uh, polygon section, we also include the embarkment also. So uh, during the calculation of the wind, width of the road, we calculate the uh, embarkment also, but only in the polygon or that provided by RAE website. So the embarkment also was uh, much more than these numbers that we uh, you all see in our presentation, because the area was very limited. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, we don't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for that answer. And uh, another question we have on, on uh, the Q&A section has to do with fragmentation. Uh, and whether there are, I'll read it as it is, are there any examples of the wider ecological impact of the fragmentation? For example, seed dispersal or wildlife migrations resulting from turbine installation and associated road development. Uh, examples of, of analysis of, of uh, this impact. Um, uh, coming together with a comment, it, it seems the study may be limited to the analysis of areas directly disturbed uh, and if so, what recommendations can be made to better understand the broader ecological impact of such developments? Fragmentation was not taken into consideration because, as I said, uh, our methodology actually uh, was based on the estimation 
of the area that was impacted within a wind farm. So a wind farm that may include three, four, five, or six wind turbines, or so more or less, it is actually just a small uh, square, a small spatial unit, taking into consideration the broader geographical area of a municipality or, uh, or a, a, a prefecture. In my opinion, fragmentation has to be considered over broad uh, geographical units, but that was out of the scope of our study. Um, to be honest, I am not sure, I haven't really thought how we can estimate the impacts from fragmentation into the natural, uh, into the natural habitat types, because uh, uh, I don't really, um, I don't really know, and I cannot really uh, understand at this point from what I know and from um, my background at, at this moment, I cannot really understand what is actually the from the impacts from the fragmentation through the construction of roads into the habitat types. I'm not talking about animals. I'm not talking about the plant species. I'm talking about habitat types. Okay, this is my background. So at this moment with my background, I'm not sure. It has to be done in my opinion, but I cannot answer how. And certainly it has to be done in bro over broad geographical areas, not the not the polygons that we consider, not, not just the wind farms. Okay, excellent. Thank, thanks a lot. I think we have a, an open door for another research project to a lot of colleagues who can look into, into this thing. And, and, a fi and a final question, which is a, a bit more factual in nature, is, is the 6220 grassland priority habitat type the only grassland to take into consideration? Uh, or are there more in Greece or Mediterranean, more, prior, more priority grassland habitats? Uh, for the study area, based on our site visits and based on our knowledge, and based also in the literature uh, review that we had, uh, we conducted, we actually consider all the um, Natura 2000 sites with the mapping and the recording of the habitat types. We realized that the grasslands that they have been uh, mapped and considered were either 62A0 or 6220. Uh, both are very similar. They're both considered as dry grasslands. I suppose, for example, in the Dia Forest, uh, I had a recent uh, research and I realized that there is an extra, uh, two extra habitat types that occur there. It's possible to have more habitat types, especially when we, uh, um, but uh, I think the vast majority are consist the grassland, the vast majority of the grassland consists of these two habitat types, at least in the study area there. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Fotin Christos. Thank you for, for an excellent presentation and the discussion. And um, uh, we can move on to, to our next presentation. It is the, the last before we have a, a short break. And, uh, and I will introduce that on, on a short uh, personal notice many, many years back when, when we started looking into the impacts of, uh, uh, of wind farms on, uh, on uh, birds and biodiversity in trees. Um, uh, personally, I was, I was really, really negatively surprised uh, by the impacts these, uh, these installations had on, on, on bats. And uh, that was many years ago. And we did this, this first assessment together with uh, Dr. Panagiotis Yorgakakis, who will also be our presenter uh, for the next presentation, uh, Panagiotis is a bat, he's a biologist, he's, a, he's a, a bat expert, a prominent bat expert in, in Greece, and he's a, a scientific associate of the Natural History Museum of the University of Crete and a member of the IUCN Bat Specialist Group. So, Panagiotis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kostadinos. Uh, as uh, previous uh, presenters said there are many wind farms in Thrace and um, most of them are not studied regarding the impacts uh, on bats or very poorly studied. The best data set we have is from a study that VVF uh, Greece, VVF last did in 15 years ago and started 
in 2008 and lasted for three years. And I was very honored to participate and analyze together with colleagues uh, mortality data and produce uh, uh, an article published in a, in a journal. Um, and this study was focused in a small percentage of the wind turbines situated in the area uh, after a, an exploratory period uh, only 88 wind turbines were selected and they were visited five or six days a week by two field workers um, which were searching in an, air, uh, in an area of up to 50 meters radius around each wind turbine and this lasted for a full year uh, this is the wind turbines where, which were searched with black dots in the red frame. Uh, but around this, inside this and around this, there are other uh, 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 sorts of turbines regarding the uh, estimations on bad casualty. Uh, as I said before, and I'm going to talk about that later on. So for the whole extended period of searches, uh, 192 bats were found dead or injured, alive injured, and they belong to nine or 10 species. Some specimens were difficult to identify, but you see that most of them are uh, four species. Um, in the upper right uh, diagram, you see that most of the carcasses were found in between April and uh, October, but the temporal, temporal patterns uh, vary between species. And also, most of the bats, we saw that they were adult males. And it was very interesting to see that uh, there's great variance between wind farms and between uh, specific wind turbines and individual wind farms regarding the number of deaths, the number of bat carcasses, and also uh, Species found can vary greatly between uh, wind farms and turbines. So this initial study left uh, some very intriguing uh, open questions like uh, which are the wind turbine and environmental characteristics that determine the number of deaths? Why is uh, such uh, variance between uh, wind farms and turbines? And second, which is the interaction scale between bad deaths and land cover characteristics. And third, how many bats are actually killed? Because uh, we search in a small percentage of wind turbines that they were existing and operating, and uh, many more are uh, in the licensing procedure or have been established uh, since then. So the Safe Flyways project, uh, which is funded by BirdLife International and Mava Foundation and we are presenting today, gave us the opportunity to uh, try to answer these questions. And uh, we tried some statistical uh, approaches uh, led by Dr. Aristides Mustakas, who is our the statistician of the group. And we managed to publish this work um, recently in a journal. And we're, we're very happy to know that uh, it has a very good acceptance between in, among the scientific community, but also uh, management bodies of protected areas have uh, delivered this study uh, through the coordinating authority and have to take this in account. 
which is a good uh, step towards uh, evaluating new proposals. Uh, what we actually did is to uh, try to analyze the number of deaths uh, regarding uh, wind turbine characteristics like tower height, uh, rotor diameter, and power of turbines, but also the percentage of land use uh, around turbines and uh, distance from water and trees, altitude, slope, and aspect different uh, landscape uh, characteristics. And we did this on different scales uh, in a radius of 250 meters, 1,000 meters, 5,000 meters. We see which is best explaining the death uh, numbers. And then we extended this to other uh, wind farms, not well studies or not studied at all or not uh, operating yet. Uh, we tried different generalized linear models to see which uh, wind turbine characteristics uh, explain uh, deaths better and so the power is the one that has the uh, uh, best explanatory uh, ability. And uh, also we tried different models uh, regarding the the interaction scale, and we found out that uh, at 5,000 meters, uh, landscape characteristics are explaining uh, uh, the number of deaths uh, better. So we used these uh, results to build our final model, and it showed that power, percentage of natural cover, and distance from water are explaining uh, most of the variants regarding number of deaths, and they have uh, the biggest coefficients, positive coefficients, and also they are more robust, uh, as shown by the sensitivity analysis, analysis which shows that uh, the coefficients did not cross zero 95% confidence intervals. And then uh, what we did is to perform an analysis called vi variance partitioning to actually rank the explanatory variables and see which is best explaining the number of death. And this is power, of course, which explains almost 40% of the deaths and then natural cover and distance from water, as you can see in this diagram. And the last step was to use this model to predict the number of deaths in other uh, wind farm groups, uh, wind farms that are very poorly surveyed by other studies, post-construction surveys with a very limited and poor quality um, sets of carcasses uh, or uh, wind farms not set at all. And of course, there is uh, wind farms that are not operating, also licensed, or uh, wind farms that are pending for license. And in total, we estimated that the number of deaths each year exceeds 1,150 bats in this area. And yeah, it will be intriguing to extend this to the rest of Greece, but the habitat characteristics uh, variability across the country is very big to go there. So to conclude, uh, wind turbine power is a characteristic that explains best the deaths. So the more power you install, the more damage you do. And uh, the optimal interaction distance between wind turbines is uh, 5,000 kilometers. So the only way to minimize the casualties is to not to place wind turbines uh, uh, close to natural areas, especially forest and water bodies. And the impact assessments should uh, extend the service range 
uh, from what they do now in, in a radius of a few hundred meters to a much greater area. And this is supported by other studies that shows that wind turbines attract bats. So if you go before the construction for an EIA, for an EIA to look for bats in the proposed seating area, this doesn't tell you much because bats will come when you uh, install the wind turbines and they will come from a much bigger distance. Um, and we have to have in mind that the estimated deaths are almost always uh, much fewer compared to the actual ones because uh, nobody's taking account seltzer efficiency and the removal of carcasses by scavengers. So the problem is even bigger. Uh, but a usual question is, how big is the problem uh, regarding the effect on the population? And nobody's able to reply to this because for the species that are usually killed in wind turbines, population estimates are almost impossible because they roost in trees or rock crevices and cannot count them. Um, they fly at night, as you know, but uh, there are all uh, species with very low reproductive uh, rates. They have one baby per year, high infant mortality, so they are very sensitive to man-made mortality. And that's why there are certain uh, very detailed guidelines in other countries and also in a European level, like the guidelines that has been produced by Eurobats and are translated to Greek and uploaded to the uh, website of the Ministry of the Environment. So they have to be followed. And the results of the assessment have been openly accessible and they have to be used because uh, we see uh, sometimes uh, post-construction surveys that say that we found uh, this number of bats, dead bats, but it's small and it's not uh, justified why it's small or it may say that it's big, but nothing is happening. They're just doing the uh, surveys and write the results, but they are not being used. Uh, this is from my side. Thank you for your attention. I don't know if there's any questions to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Panagiotis, for a very, really interesting uh, presentation. I have uh, uh, one question for you, uh, which uh, has to do with um, the question is, since we know that uh, bats don't, don't fly when we have strong winds, uh, could a requirement for a cut-in speed in, uh, in wind farms so that they only operate uh, above a certain level of, of wind speed, uh, bring, a, bring a solution or anyway, a slight solution, <laughs> a minimization of the impact on, on bats. This will be my recommendation for existing wind farms. And it, if we made a rough uh, calculation, the loss for the, for the, let's say the owner of the wind farm is not that big because we're talking about certain uh, uh, period of the year or even certain nights um, through the warm season and uh, it's only some hours a day during the night and mostly a few hours after sunset so it's not a big deal but Yes, uh, this is one part of the solution. Proper seating is the first and most important because it's not only mortality, but it's also habitat loss and fragmentation and other things. So yes, uh, uh, establishing a cutting speed is a very important measure, but not the only thing. Okay. 
thank you, thank you very much, uh, Panagiotis. I think we don't have any other questions, so uh, I can release you. We will be breaking for for a short uh, break, but just before we do that, uh, there was a question a bit earlier uh, that came just a bit late, and we didn't have a a chance to uh, to answer it. And I think it goes to Lefteris Kakalis. Uh, the question had to do with the automated system that we analyze in the wind farms and whether this is the automated system of wind turbine, is it is it the one that stops the wind turbines when a bird is approaching? Yeah, this is the system. And uh, when a bird uh, comes uh, toward uh, the wind turbine uh, and trigger the system, uh, there is an activation of uh, warning sounds. Uh, I think there are two stages of this. And then if the bird uh, continue flying uh, toward the, the turbine, the turbine stop. And um, the main finding of our studies uh, um, the, for the vultures, uh, they, um, the system uh, is, is uh, stops for uh, the majority or, or for the half cases for black vulture, and uh, for one third uh, of the flights of griffon vulture. So we need uh, to somehow to study this, to study the effectiveness of these uh, systems, especially for, uh, for the vultures. Excellent, thanks a lot, uh, Lefteri. So uh, with this answer, we conclude the, 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 the first part uh, of, uh, of our discussion. We will take, a very short break for, for bio needs or coffee or whatever. Uh, so we will break now and we'll be back starting with our next presentation in uh, uh, half past. So that's, that's in, in five minutes from now. So see you all in, in five minutes. Okay, here we are. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. And that was, that was really short, but I, I hope we're all back and we can start with our with our next presentation that uh, focuses on um, on the considerations we had where it all where it all started, and that that's the impact of, of the wind farms on the, on the key priority species, on some of the key priority species uh, on these uh, sites. Uh, we have with us uh, Labrentis Sidiropoulos. Uh, Labrentis is a, a field ornithologist. He's an expert on uh, on raptor ecology, and he's he has worked for many years in the area. And he's uh, currently conducting his PhD mm -hmm. at the University of uh, of Ioannina. And uh, Laverde, you will be giving us a, a presentation on the effects of wind farm development in the priority species uh, of the scenarios grief on vulture and grief on vultures and the golden eagles, the cumulative impact that is. So the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Oops. Uh, hello from me too. Uh, I will be. Uh, oh, sorry. Hello from me too. I will be describing the effects of uh, this industrial scale wind farm development has on the three priority species, as Kostadin said. In particular, we are looking at the cumulative collision mortality and displacement for scenarios and griffon vultures and the golden eagle. Uh, of course, uh, wind power is among the most valuable tools for uh, uh, towards achieving the green energy transition that will mitigate climate change and, uh, of course, for Greece it will augment energy autonomy and uh, economic development. But without careful sighting, uh, wind farm development, especially at this scale and these areas, can have significant irreversible impacts on sensitive species, their habitats, and the relevant conservation targets uh, of the sites of the protected areas designated for them. Thrace, uh, in particular, is a typical example of problematic spatial planning. Uh, as some of the most important SPAs in the country uh, designated for their importance for the conservation of large raptors, uh, which are, by definition, the most sensitive species uh, to wind farm development. 
was also selected as a wind farm priority area. Uh, we have thus up to date uh, 265 installed and functioning wind turbines. 11 more are under installation, or I'm not sure, but now it might be even under testing regimes. And uh, 74 more uh, that have been granted environmental approval terms and are expected to be installed soon. Uh, we can therefore reason about a conflict between the unfolding industrial scale wind farm development and the conservation of priority species and the areas designated to this aim. Uh, as I said, there are four SPAs with sensitive trigger species. Among them, uh, there are three species with extensive telemetry data sets that allowed us to look into our research questions. In particular, the last scenarios vulture population of Southeastern Europe estimated about 120 individuals. Uh, one of the largest griffon vulture population in continental Balkans at around 380 individuals. And uh, arguably the most important continuous population of golden eagles nationally, uh, 10 pairs uh, from uh, a number of, uh, this population has been reduced from a number of nearly double in the past 15 years. So we looked at the collision mortality estimation. Uh, we used the published method of uh, Vasilakis et al, who was uh, part of our research team. Uh, from his earlier relevant PhD research in the area. Uh, we calculated utilization distributions as fixed kernels on a plug-in bandwidth. For vultures, it was conducted for the breeding and non-breeding season as the methodology required. And for eagles, we adapted it to each year. We used the individual utilization distributions, other as if we had one season of data from the same bird, and average them for the population by dividing with the number of birds in the end. Uh, we derived the flight height and speed above ridges uh, from telemetry data, as well as uh, the proportion of the population using uh, its wind farm, again from telemetry data. This information was fed to the band collision risk model for turbines that are installed under installation and with published environmental approval terms, uh, that is 350 turbines. And we extrapolated for future development scenario based on the number of plant turbines and uh, conservative estimates of their use by the birds. So for the scenarios vulture, uh, our data set spanned uh, 2016 to 2022, was more than 2 million fixes and was from 40 individuals. Uh, we used the avoidance rate of 98% uh, as uh, required for species where this has not been uh, uh, calculated before, and this as it's accepted in the literature. And this resulted to 8.15 deaths per annum on the current uh, capacity, on the 350 turbines, that's that what we mean with current capacity here, corresponding to 6.8% of the population. In the extreme scenario, where all plant turbines, more or this more than 900 additional, are installed, uh, this number turned to 36 deaths, uh, with a conservative estimate of 10 to 8, no, realistic conservative estimate of 10 to 18% of plant turbines. This number turns to 13 to 16 deaths from collision per year, corresponding to 11 13% of the population. For the Griffon vulture, our data set uh, was uh, from 32 individuals, spanned the same period, again, more than 2 million fixes. Uh, we used, again, the avoidance rate 98% that was corroborated for the area from an earlier uh, study. Uh, and this resulted on 15 deaths per annum in the current capacities, corresponding to 3.9% of the population. Uh, with all plant turbines, this number turns to 27 deaths, corresponding to 7% of the population. And with uh, 10 to 18% of plant turbines, 17 to 18 deaths, 
that is four to five percent of the population. For the golden eagles, we had data, telemetry data from six territorial individuals with more than one million fixes from the period 2000 to 2020, sorry, 2020 to 2022. Uh, for the four remaining territories, we use the predictions of the path ranging model that assigns a use value to a cell, an area cell, based on the distance from nest and the relief, the topography. We use the avoidance rate of 99% here. Uh, this resulted to 11.6 deaths per annum on the current capacity. And uh, any scenario, of course, of increased list to rapid population extinction. Even with the 99.9% .9 avoidance rate, that is the highest used in the literature, it still amounted to about one bird per year, which is still significant for a population, a declining population of this size. Uh, to investigate displacement, uh, we compared the vultures utilization distributions in different periods. Uh, dividing the latest to the earliest around turbines. For the scenarios vultures, these periods were 2016 to 2022 and uh, 2009 to 2012, which was an earlier data set used in the previous research. Uh, this produced an index more than one implies increase in use and less than one decrease in use. A similar approach was used for the Griffon vultures, but we divided the available data in two periods between 2016 and 2018 and 2019 to 2021, but we detected no change. Uh, for the Golden Eagle, the time span of the data set did not allow for this. Uh, so we looked at the behavior of tagged individuals around installed turbines in relation to their behavior around plant turbines in their vicinity with a use availability design. Uh, we isolated thus the 265 uh, functioning installed and functioning turbines and 444 plant uh, within five kilometers around them. And we also took care to eliminate plant turbines that were within the one kilometer distance of the installed ones. Uh, use, we used as the use index, the proportion of locations within 10, 100 meter distance bands spanning, that is from zero to one kilometer from Sterbank, and the availability, the total area of each band. Sorry. For the scenarios vulture, there was a pronounced reduction of ranging use and air operational wind farms. Uh, we found that 81% of the 26 currently installed wind farms showed a reduced use. Uh, and uh, in 38 to 58% of them, depending on the season that we looked, uh, the effect of this reduction was very pronounced, exceeding 85%. Nearly all wind farms in this category had collision deterrent systems installed, uh, 14 out of uh, 15. In uh, for the rest of the wind farms, 23 to 30 percent, again, depending on season, uh, so the reduction of uh, 45 to 55 percent. Uh, for the golden eagle, there was a uh, again, we have an index that uh, more than one implies avoidance, less than one preference, and uh, values close to one and neutral behavior. Uh, there was a clear avoidance of operational turbines compared to plant turbines uh, where there was preference. On the left, you can see the distribution of the locations around the turbines. Uh, the histograms of the right are a distribution of the preference index from 1,000 random samples of 10% of the data. So in operational turbines, there is a clear avoidance in the band of 0 to 100 meter category and neutral behavior in the band of 100 to 200 meters. And uh, the opposite happens in plant turbines where it uh, turns into a very strong preference for both bands. Uh, okay, this is due to the preference of eagles to ridges um, where uh, uh, updrafts are uh, usually higher, more stronger, and uh, also where the turbines are usually cited. 
Uh, for the Golden Eagle, I must say, this displacement has another crucial, crucial dimension as it's a territorial species with a continuous saturated population, assuming all the colonies, all the territories will be occupied. And this means that uh, pairs that are displaced cannot compensate for this essentially its habitat loss by expanding the range in its neighboring territories. Uh, so as a conclusion, as the conclusions, we can say that the SPA or the Noceverus quilada, the Rio, which is still important for vulture transit and foraging flights. And it also maintains four pairs of golden eagles and three more vacant at the moment territories where habitats are still in good condition. And according to the official, conserv official now conservation targets of the site uh, should be reinstated. And uh, it is likely as golden eagles tend to recolonize the same localities if the population is rebounding. Uh, so this SPA so far is relatively unaffected by wind farm development and should remain as such as the previously exclusion zone proposals in the area, including uh, the research mentioned earlier, require. And in general, it might be a good idea that spatial planning starts take these proposals more seriously. It would largely mitigate the problem. Uh, the construction of more wind farms in Thrace, based on our analysis, uh, can have significant irreversible impacts on the population of the three priority species, their habitats, and the sites designed for their conservation, as their estimated collision rates are very high and optimal habitat use is affected through displacement. As Lefteri stressed, a holistic standardized approach is required for the appropriate assessment and post-construction monitoring with uh, subsequent dissemination of results that will enable uh, the assessment of the impacts at the population level. And uh, finally, the use of uh, collision deterrent systems should be evaluated uh, as it, uh, it might mitigate uh, collision mortality, but at the same time, it is displacing, seems to be displacing birds from uh, the habitats in protected areas. And at least in no case should be considered as the only necessary prerequisite for wind farm installation in sensitive localities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lavredis. I think we should. Okay, here we are. Thank you very much for this uh, for this presentation. And uh, before we go uh, to to the next presentation, I have a, one question here on our Q and A. Um, and the question is: uh, All uh, pre studies uh, and post construction studies of wind farms are mainly focused. Uh, on the threat of collisions yes based on based on your analysis how important are at the end the the uh the displacement threat and how this should be or whether this should be uh included in the in the pre-studies in the environmental evaluations or even on uh, national or eu legislation uh, okay this cannot be answered the impact of the displacement needs uh, demographic data to be answered uh, for a start in long term uh, monitoring. So for example, for the Golden Eagle, we don't have this data. Uh, on the other hand, we're talking about special protection areas, uh, which are specifically designated for the conservation of these species. Uh, the legislation already protects their habitat, and displacement is an effective uh, habitat loss. So, uh, of course, there should be uh, they should be somehow incorporated in the impact assessments, and uh, but uh, this requires consideration as this how this can be quantified on observational data which usually the impact assessments uh, use. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that. 
we don't have any questions for now so we can move on to the to our next presentation and we have with us uh, Dr. Anastasios uh, Bunas is an evolutionary ecologist with um, a special uh, interest and expertise on how future environmental changes affects bio communities. And uh, we will be looking on, uh, on some scenarios on the viability analysis for the, for the black, vulture, black vulture, I'm sorry, and, the, and an extinction risk assessment uh, under the future scenarios of wind farm developments. Anastasia is there, the floor, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Hi from me. Uh, I would like to, to thank the Society for the Protection of Biodiversity of Thrace for organizing this event. Uh, now, on my part, I will try to provide a look uh, in the past, present, and future of the population of uh, scenarios of vulture in Dadia National Park and the level of population, not just individuals. Uh, through the implementation of some uh, population models that I will uh, explain to you. Uh, so most of my colleagues have talked about the role, the possible effects of wind farms. You have uh, heard about most of this stuff. So it would be more useful uh, to tell you a couple of things uh, about the basics of population ecology. So we are all in the same page. Uh, so four are the basic processes, let's say, that can affect, uh, they can shape uh, the size of the population. Uh, some individuals are recruited in the population by emigration or they leave it by immigration, but the most important role is played by births and deaths. So actually this difference between the rate of the individuals that are born and the rate that individuals die uh, determines if the population increases or decreases. And that is the fundamental equation that we use in most of the uh, ecological models, and we build upon that, let's say. So quantifying those parameters, births and deaths, survival, stuff like that, uh, we can then examine how their change affects the population. Uh, and if they happen to change, if this change is really important. Uh, one basic approach used to assess how population will respond to increased mortality, let's say, to calculate those demographic parameters, calculate how they change, and then project uh, the population uh, through a population viability analysis. This is what the population viability analysis does, and that's what we did uh, in this study. Uh, Long-lived species, such as the scenarios vulture, are like, extremely sensitive to the additional adult mortality, as we will see. Uh, currently, the population of the Cinerius vulture in Latvia uh, consists of a colony numbering about 36 pairs uh, and shows uh, an increasing term in, in, in the long term, actually. But some signs of stability uh, are shown in the last few years uh, in the short term. Uh, it is known that uh, such small, such partially restricted populations uh, can be subject to increased extinction risks, uh, can be very, very vulnerable to increase mortality, to change, uh, either from threats or from stochastic events. But uh, in fact, despite the long conservation effort in the past and the ongoing conservation efforts uh, to mitigate the threats in this population, uh, it's still affected by high mortality. Uh, mainly, that happens due to uh, poisoning, illegal poison use, uh, collision with already operational wind turbines, and uh, electrocution with power lines. These are the three main uh, causes of mortality in the, in the national park. Uh, so on our part to examine the state of the population, in what state the population is, we built an integrated population model, an IPM uh, for the species. Uh, you can see a graphical depiction of the model built here. Uh, I will not go into many details, but I'm available for everything you might uh, need. Uh, also in the reports in, in, in these uh, uh, studies that they will go online, everything is written there with much detail. Uh, so demographic parameters that we calculated are shown in blue circles. These are the survival for each age class, for juveniles, for immatures, for adults. Uh, it's the fecundity. Uh, so this is what we are interested to calculate. And these green uh, rectangles are the data, are the data that uh, we used in the model. 
Uh, so what are those data? We combined actually different sources of data that were collected by the guys in the Diana National Park the, three, the last three decades, 30 years. Uh, now, long-term monitoring of the black vulture, of the Cenarius vulture, and that include uh, annual population counts, uh, also breeding success data uh, that has been done in the national park. And also we used data to actually to, to help uh, calculate survival better uh, of a long-term mark recapture program in that, yeah, uh, there has been, uh, the guys have been putting wind tanks from I think 95 or, some, or around somewhere there. Uh, they've been putting wind tanks on birds. So we could know if a bird uh, in each time, in its observation event, is being alive or uh, dead. So using those data, first of all, what we did uh, was to uh, estimate those demographic parameters for the scenarios vulture population, and then use them to simulate the demographic change in the future and calculate the probability of extinction uh, for the next 20 years. This is the first step is, is with no additional mortality. It's a baseline scenario. Uh, and the survival rates, what we found in the results was that uh, survival rates uh, have been a little bit uh, low, especially for juveniles. Uh, the dynamic of the population, th there are no actual big differences with literature. Productivity is slightly lower than for the Spanish population, for example. Uh, then the dynamics of the population uh, seem to be driven mainly by adult survival. That's consistent with a long-lived long species like the Cenarius vulture. Uh, so in years where adults uh, experience low survival rates, then the population is decreasing. In years when adults uh, have high survival, there is low mortality of survival birds, uh, the population is increasing. Uh, it was the only demographic parameter that correlates with growth rate of the population. Uh, so between 1993 and 2021, the population of the of the Cenarius vulture increased uh, at a mean rate, mean annual rate, 4.3 percent per year. And when it was projected, then in the future, in 20 years in the future, it showed a stability actually with a very very slow. A uh, decline of 10% in 20 years. Uh, that means that we could be losing three pairs or something like that in 20 years until two, 2040. Uh, so uh, after that, after that, we moved on and used this model as a basis and examined the likely impacts of uh, wind farm development in the region. And we calculated demography and extinction probability at three future scenarios of wind farm uh, development. These scenarios were the ones previously presented by Lavrentis uh, Sidiropoulos in his presentation. Uh, it included the establishment. Scenario A was the establishment of 85 wind turbines. Uh, 11 of them are currently installed, but they are not operating, and 74 uh, have not yet been installed, but they have received the decision for the approval of environmental terms. Uh, so they are expected to be installed. Uh, so these 85 wind turbines lead to 1.94, almost two dead scenarios vultures per year. For scenarios B and C, it's the, must, it's the much worse scenario of 934 wind turbines that are designed to be installed in, uh, in trace. Uh, and this, in these scenarios, the only thing that changes is the use, the space used uh, by the population. If the 25% of the population uses the space, we have a low uh, use. Uh, then we expect that 28 uh, scenarios vultures will be will die every every year. And if the majority of the population uses the area, uh, 65 scenarios vultures will die per year. So in the first scenario, if those 85 future wind turbines with a positive decision for the approval of environmental terms will be established in the area, 
then the population extinction is estimated at uh, around 16.4 percent after 20 years uh extinction probability you see here uh and an overall 44 percent decrease in the breeding purse is expected after uh, 20 years by 2040 and that is compared to the baseline scenario that you see with a, a black line here so we actually have uh, a severe decline of the population uh, now as it's expected i mean most probably we, we wouldn't really need a model for that but if 934 wind farms are, are wind turbines are placed in the region uh the population goes extinct within a few years uh, 90 percent probability of extinction is reached within six years from operation if the area is, is used by a small percent of the population and then uh, if most of the population uses the area around the, the wind farms uh, then within four years extinction is uh, like 98 percent probable so summarizing sorry uh, summarizing, future increase in the wind farm density uh, could lead to the destabilization of the population in all examined scenarios. The lowest impact scenario that we had in mind, the operation of 85 wind turbines, still uh, greatly accelerates extinction risk within 20 years and severely decreases uh, population size. Uh, that means that it's further limiting the population growth. We will have a rapidly declining population and this population is really really small now it will be even smaller in 20 years and most prone to extinction uh, of course as, as expected all these extreme scenarios of uh, future establishment of wind turbines will lead to uh, population extinction it cannot be avoided uh, our results show actually give a quantitative warning let's say on how uh, this additional mortality can impact the population viability of long-lived species, such as vultures. Uh, they further highlight the need for examining those impacts, uh, wind farms, on the population level, rather than focusing on just individuals or, or there's not many dead individuals, but still uh, the population level picture is the, is the one that can give uh, some information about the, the, the long-term impacts. Uh, of wind farms. Uh, one of the main priority tasks for successful conservation of the scenarios vulture is to reduce non-natural mortality that is shown but by our results for sure. Uh, so this uh, has to be done by reducing all those severe threats that operate in the area, illegal poisoning and the operation of already installed uh, wind farms. Uh, this somehow needs to be tackled. It could be that uh, this wind turbine related mortality can be actually lowered by removing some uh, wind turbines that have been found to be associated with uh, high collision risks. And of course, future planning of the, of the, of the establishment of the wind farms in the area uh, should consider uh, taking in mind that the species, the endangered species in the area and be done outside of the areas that are critical for such species. Uh, thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasis, for, for an excellent and very interesting uh, presentation. Let's hope that the, the doom scenarios don't materialize and logic prevails and we have a, a reduction in the, in the intense uh, investments planned uh, for the future. Now, I have a, one question for you, but uh, before moving on to that question, we are, as we are approaching the, the end of our meeting today, uh, I would encourage anyone from, from the audience who wants to, to write questions uh, in the Q&A overall and, you know, to whomever speaker uh, they want to, to address. Uh, we still have some time. We, we are exactly on schedule, so we have the time to, to take more questions uh, if you want. Bar the questions that have to do with the land cover impacts of, uh, of roads and, uh, and wind farms because uh, Dr. Tsistrakis and Dr. Damianidis uh, had a preoccupation and had to leave a bit a bit earlier. Uh, now, go, going back to you, Anastasis, I have a, a question, which is, it says, uh, given the uh, business as usual, uh, even under the business as usual scenario, uh, we see that 
after 2022, we still have a, a reduction, a small reduction in the population of the black vulture. Uh, and where does this, oh, could that be that the, the, the population have uh, reached a certain limit for, for, for the space available? Or anyway, what are your, your estimations on that? Yeah, uh, this does not seem very, very uh, probable. Let's say that the population has reached its limit. It's more that they are the cumulative effects of every threat are starting to show in the population after some years, especially in long lived uh, raptors, uh, that they take five or six years to reproduce for the first time. Uh, so this increased mortality is shown with some time delay. Uh, what I mean is that still in the last years, we see already see a stability in the population trend. It's not something that will happen. We still see that something is, is, is uh, uh, reducing, something uh, reduces this population's ability to grow. Uh, that probably for me, it is the, all, all those threats, it's a mix of all those threats operating right now as the already installed wind turbines and the illegal poison use for sure, uh, threats that operate and kill uh, breeders. Uh, of course, uh, another thing that, that shows that this is not the case that the population has reached, let's say, its uh, uh, current capacity is that we, we don't show any uh, immigration out of the area. We would have some uh, some colonies outside from Badia National Park in Bulgaria. There, there is a very good habitat in Bulgaria, for example, but we don't see any birds breeding there. So it's not that this population is limited that way. Okay. Thanks a lot. And and, uh, and another question uh, popped up now. Uh, is it, uh, does the size of the 84 wind turbines under scenario A, uh, the size of the rotor blades uh, matters, makes a difference? Uh, and are the scenarios taken, have the scenarios taken into account the automated system for the DT bird for, for avoidance of collision? Uh, that uh, probably Lavrendis would be the most capable person of answering because the scenarios are actually uh, from this from, from this study. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. So maybe Lavrin, do you want to, to, to pick this up? Yes, the technical characteristics of these turbines. Are you talking about the 74? The 84, yes. Okay. Uh, ah, the tech are known for these turbines. And uh, given that we already have collision uh, deterrent systems installed in the populations, uh, the mortality given to Tassos the, under the current scenario largely incorporates this. Good. Thank you. And um, another question that uh, was directed to Anastasis, but could probably be answered by some of the other speakers as well is, do we have the percentages of the main causes of mortality uh, that you refer to, poisoning, wind farms, electricity? So, uh, are they distributed? That could be done, actually. I, I don't have it in front of me. It could be done. We could see how many birds have died from those threats, but uh, the, the important, the trap here uh, that we shouldn't fall in is that from every threat we do not find all individuals so if i say to you that from poisoning we lost two egyptian two uh Cineros vultures uh, per year this is not the, the 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 real impact of the threat because the probability of finding those dead birds uh is is really low so we could give an estimate from the percentage of each threat, but, but, but still we have to take into account uh, the probability of finding dead birds from each threat. If, uh, for example, pylons, electric pylons are monitored daily, then yeah, you, your census data may match the, the reality. You find all the dead birds in the pylon, but that doesn't happen. But it is doable. I mean, it, it could be done. Okay. Thanks a lot. And I think that was uh, the last question. Anastasis, again, thank you very much for... for thank you, too. Many thanks. And uh, 
I have another question from uh, from a while before. It was submitted a bit a bit later, and it, and it uh, uh, refers to you, left Eris, uh, Mr. Kakalis, and it, uh, it follows up on the discussion we had on on the DT bird system. And the question is uh, whether uh, all wind turbines are, are obliged to have this system. Uh, if it is obligatory, that is, and if you know since when this has become obligatory for for new investments. Uh, there is obligatory uh, for for many uh, wind farms, but uh, till now, uh, few of them they put the systems. Um, we just wait for for the rest to 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 put the systems. But uh, uh, as the other colleagues uh, mentioned, mm, the automated systems. Um, may help or minimize the problem, but uh, as um, Tashus said, the trend of the population, uh, it's the same. Uh, they incorporate in their models uh, this uh, fact. So if I answer, that was, I don't know if, uh, I gave an answer to, to to the question. Yeah, I think I think you have uh, the theory. So the understanding okay. is that they, they they are obligatory, but this is not always. It is a, it is obligatory for many wind farms, but uh, we are still waiting for 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 the companies to put this uh, system on. But I I understand from from and most the, of the questions. The other thing is that the, the trend uh, of uh, the, the the obligation to put these systems. Uh, is uh, raising uh, the recent year, the recent periods from 2016 till today. Um, uh, there is a, a growth uh, on this uh, environmental condition, in um, and many wheat farms are obligated to put them. Uh, but uh, this is not uh, the solution of uh, the collision. Uh, of uh, vultures and uh, raptors. Yeah. We should uh, consider this. I think that experience from many environmental fronts show that all these end of the pipe solutions, you know, are just the, the last resort. Uh, there are many things we need to do before. And I think what we've heard today is that there is no substitute for, for the proper siting, proper pre-construction evaluation of, of possible impacts and proper design and then and then siting of the, of the investments. Um, I think we wrap it up. I don't see any other question uh, on the on the Q and A session. I want to uh, to thank uh, all the all the speakers for for these great presentations and the and the good discussions and and for 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 keeping up uh, with uh, with the time limits and uh, making it possible to uh, to end in uh, in in time. All the presentation will be uploaded in the next days uh, on the website of the Society for the Protection of Biodiversity of Thrace. Uh, once this is done, an email will be sent to all registered participants with a, with a link so you can go download and, and study uh, these reports yourself. On our side, we have already started to you know distill the main conclusions and trying to disseminate them and provide guidance. Uh, to authorities and educate the decisions made by authorities, but also from from investment. So we are starting out uh, uh, on this work. Uh, closing, uh, a big thank you to, of course, the speakers, as I said, and, and the whole team that you have not seen uh, today: Doras Katsi, Ella Kret, Eleftheris uh, Kapsalis, is the team uh, of the society that has worked. From day one to make all these studies possible and who have made also this uh, this event yesterday and today and all these presentations possible and a big thank you to the always you know the heroes who never who never appear on this kind of of, uh, of events xenophondas kajidimitriou thodoris yutos from the sustain events who have taken care of all the technical uh issues and and made our discussions uh, possible again many thanks for your participation and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.